The doctrine of the Incarnation can seem highly abstract. In questions 2 to 6 of the Teresha Pars of the Summa Theologiae, Thomas Aquinas devotes 36 dense articles to the Incarnation. He first inquires into the union itself. Did the union of God and man take place in the natures, resulting in a tertium quid? Or did the union take place in the divine person? Is this the same as saying that it took place in the divine suppositum or hypostasis? If it took place in the person, does this mean that after the incarnation, the divine person has changed? If, it, if the divine person has not changed, can we really say that the divine person subsists in a true sense in two natures, divine and human? Does the word take the place of the soul in Jesus Christ? Or is Jesus' humanity characterized by a soul-body unity like everybody else's? If the latter, would not Jesus be a human person, in which case the divine person would not be the fundamental principle of unity, and Jesus would have not only two natures, but also two persons? Is the union of the human nature to the divine nature in the person of the Son an accidental union, meaning that the human nature is not really united to the Word any more than clothes are united to a man? Many more such abstract questions follow in Aquinas' treatment. I've surveyed the contents just there briefly of only seven of the 36 articles contained in questions two to six. One could see how metaphysically dense such questions are. It's noteworthy that although Aristotle and various church fathers and councils are quoted many times by Aquinas in the above seven articles, he does not quote scripture even once. Um, Aquinas is not to blame for the abstractness of these questions, of course. In fact, they are all found in the church fathers, and they constitute the very heart of the Christological controversies resolved by the first ecumenical councils. Questions such as these are necessary, as the fathers realized, in order to clarify and specify what is meant when we affirm with the Gospel of John, quote, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Aidan Nichols points out that Aquinas' presentation of these points, quote, sums up the true mind of the fathers and councils, end quote. We should be deeply grateful that, as Father Nichols says, Aquinas uses, quote, his profound philosophy of being, his metaphysics, to underpin the teaching of the fathers, and especially the teaching of St. Cyril of Alexandria, influential on the third, fourth, and fifth councils, who so strongly emphasize the unity of the person of Christ as God made man. Now, Reginald Garagulagrange's commentary on the Tershapars reflects a similar philosophical density, though infused even more than Aquinas' own texts by references to historical controversies, including controversies from the centuries after Aquinas. Gregory Lagrange begins by listing and explaining the various Christological errors advocated by heretical Christians in the early centuries. His list includes the following, uh, um, the following among the heretics, quote, um, Ebionites, uh, this isn't a quote, um, Ebionites, Cerinthians, Arians, Apollinarians, Docetus, Valentinians, Nestorians, and Monophysites. While he spells out the heresies further, he adds subgroups, such as Adoptionists, Gnostics, Marcionites, and Manichaeans, and to these he adds modern post-Reformation, Socinians, Unitarians, Liberal Protestants, and Catholic More um, By contrast to Aquinas' lack of biblical citations in these, in these questions, Gregory Lagrange's treatment of the metaphysical issues about the union regularly pauses to offer what he terms scriptural proof. For example, on the mode of union, which takes place in the person, uh, Gergou Lagrange adduces the following four biblical passages, which he thinks show that Christ is truly God and truly man. Isaiah 9, 6, John 14, 6, Philippians 2, 6, and 1 John 1, 1. He explains with regard to Philippians 2, Quote, here we have the twofold form of nature, twofold form or nature, namely of God and the servant, each distinct without confusion of natures. End quote. Similarly, Bernard Lonergan's lengthy scholastic treatise, De Verbo Incarnato, contains over 200 dense pages reflecting upon the metaphysics of the incarnation before turning to equally difficult problems such as Christ's grace and knowledge. Lonergan devotes his opening reflections on Jesus as true God and true man, not only to stating the thesis and its opponents, but also briefly to adducing the biblical evidence. 
For example, among the modern opponents of, to his thesis, Lonergan describes the following position, quote, our Lord was an exceptional man, a supreme religious genius, an incarnation of that objective spirit which makes and constitutes history and has many other incarnations, end quote. When he turns to the biblical evidence, Lonergan is equally attuned to modern issues. For instance, he states that, quote, the New Testament itself does not make use of just one manner of conceiving, but of many, and these unfold little by little, and he adds the more controversial and potentially problematic because of its difficulty to demonstrate, and it's requiring far more intensive study and breadth of expertise, claim that, Quote, if the teaching of the New Testament is not understood according to its own conceptualities, there will be no understanding of the fathers or the problems resolved at the councils, end quote. Reflecting briefly upon biblical foundations, Lonergan argues that, quote, the title Son of Man is a prospective pattern, end quote, whereas the affirmations of his divinity or of his identity as the new Adam that's the first reference to the actual topic of this, this talk. Uh, apologize for that. And similar affirmations involve a, quote, retrospective pattern or an inverse retrospective pattern. This was Lonergan's genius, you know. He, anyway, he, moving retrospectively behind Lonergan's earthly life to his pre exist behind Jesus' earthly life. <laughs> uh, that my mentor, Father Lamb, was a Lonerganian, so, so I'm sure he's, he's smiling somewhere. Um, behind Jesus' early life to his pre-existence, or moving from the retrospective affirmation of his pre-existence to make affirmations about Jesus as a man, either in his earthly life or in his glorified state. In making such arguments, Lonergan points to numerous biblical passages that suggest the kinds of patterns that he has in view. As an example of his practice, we can take Lonergan's thesis, quote, the divine word united to himself, flesh animated by a rational soul, end quote. He defines his terms by appeal to John 1, 1, John 1, 15, and the Council of Nicaea. He notes that his thesis comes from the following sources, Cyril of Alexandria's second letter to Nestorius, as is affirmed by the Council of Ephesus, Constantinople 1 and 3, the Council of Chalcedon, and the Council of Rome in 382. He then lists the patristic era Christians who had den who denied that Jesus had a soul, and he devotes attention to the Apollinarians. When he turns to his own argument, he begins by defending Jesus' claim to be true man through brief appeal to two verses in Acts, three each in Matthew and in Luke, four in Mark, two in Hebrews, and one each in Philippians and Romans. Lonergan then cites a wide array of church fathers, thereby minimizing as much as he can the abstractness of the question. This path of quick lists of citations, or for, for lack of a better word, proof texting, serves a helpful purpose. One can see why both Gergu Lagrange and Lonergan have added this element to the presentation offered by Thomas Aquinas. They thereby exhibit the biblical and patristic grounding of otherwise seemingly mere uh, philosophical debates, of course, about theological matters. As Thomas Joseph White has shown in his The Incarnate Lord, a Thomistic study of Christology, quote, a Christological reflection that is more overtly metaphysical in kind can also take full and realistic account of the historical characteristics of cosmic, historical, and human reality, end quote. Indeed, this is an achievement not only of White's book, but also in their own ways and to varying degrees of Lonergan, Gergou, Lagrange, and Aquinas. Early in his book, Father White chose on biblical grounds, quote, the inevitability of metaphysical inquiry into the person of Christ for a right understanding of Scripture itself, end quote. His book demonstrates this necessary interrelation of scripture and metaphysics. When Father White turns to his chapter on, quote, the ontology of the hypostatic union, he argues that, in fact, quote, there exists at work in modern Catholic theology a subtle but real obscuration of the deeper mystery of the hypostatic union, end quote. For example, in overthrowing neo-scholastic understandings of the incarnation as unbiblical and ahistorical, 
and in seeking to locate the union of God and man in the consciousness and interior religious history of Jesus Christ, Karl Rahner ends up promoting, says Father White, an Nestorian doctrine of the incarnation as the highest instantiation of habitual grace. It's no wonder that philosophical care needs to be taken in expressing theologically the biblically revealed mystery of the incarnation. As Corey Barnes observes with reference to Aquinas, an adequate Christology must, quote, maintain a precarious balance of the unity of Trinitarian actions at extra with the word alone as incarnate and as causing salvation through instrumental efficiency, end quote. This precision cannot be accomplished without metaphysical profundity as a requirement for theological labor. With respect to the incarnation, then, metaphysical analysis serves the task of understanding and communicating the scriptural witness to the radical uniqueness of Jesus Christ. What it means for there to be an incarnation of the divine Son without the Son changing or becoming something different from the divine Son has been well described by Father Dominic Legg, quote, because of this filial mode of existing that characterizes his person as the divine Son generated eternally by the divine Father, Christ's humanity bears the Son's personal property. Everything in that humanity takes on the filial mode of the Son, end quote. What does it mean, though, for a human nature to exist in a filial mode? How would manifesting a thoroughgoing filial mode make Christ in his humanity different from other humans? In my view, this question opens the door to a fuller contemplation of Christ, the new Adam, the fullness of what Adam should have been, given that Adam himself in the Gospel of Luke is identified as, quote, the Son of God. That's um, 338. Um, thus, rather than repeating the valuable work of Gregory Lagrange, Lonergan White, and others, my task here tonight involves approaching Christ's redemptive incarnation from another angle. I appropriate St. Paul's insight as a, stated by Matthias Joseph Shaban that, quote, the first Adam in God's design was the type of Christ as the second Adam. End quote. Before the fall, says Shaban, Adam, quote, was the direct image of Christ, but in his disobedience, he became the reverse image. My focus will be on exploring the incarnate Lord through his identity as the new Adam. At the outset, let me note that in Aquinas' biblical prelude to his metaphysics of the incarnation, specifically, uh, I have in mind here, Article 5 of Question 2 of the Ter Shapars, uh, or is that, is, I think I might have meant Question 1, I can't remember. Um, he quotes a core new Adam text. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Here, Aquinas asks why God did not simply found the whole human race at the very outset upon the new Adam, the incarnate son. Aquinas' answer is that it befits the proper order of body soul creatures to move from Adam, source of the bodily life of all humans, to the new Adam, Jesus Christ, source of the glorified spiritual bodily life graced and glorified spiritually body life of all humans. Our possession of a natural earthly life in Adam is the foundation that makes us open to receiving in the new Adam a share in the heavenly Trinitarian life. Of course, uh, it might seem that being the divine son would make Christ less a man and less Adam. But in fact, the contrary is true. Joseph Ratzinger comments, quote, that man is most fully man, indeed the true man, who is most unlimited, who not only has contact with the infinite, the infinite being, but is one with him, end quote. The hypostatic union enables the new Adam, who is a self-surrendering self son of the Father, uh, this is Ratzinger, to exercise obedient love that would have been perfective of Adam. As Ratzinger's friend Hunters von Balzar puts the matter, quote, the first Adam is not perfectible in himself. He must die to himself if he is to be lifted to the level of the second Adam. 
and wait to, of the second of the second Adam and incorporated into him that this is possible is something he owes to the second Adam, his goal and his source. End quote. The Protestant theologian Joshua McNall sounds a similar note when he points out that the basis for Christ's redemptive work is found in quote Christ's recapitulative identity as the God-Man and the true Imago Dei, that is, the new Adam. The new Adam, the point is, the new Adam is the model for the first Adam and not the other way around. Okay, so in this, in this essay, then my purpose will be to draw together and, and attempt to exploit for dogmatic purposes um, the new, new Adam Christology of Scripture, the Fathers, and Thomas Aquinas. I will proceed in three steps. First, I'll explore the Gospel of Luke's testimony to the new Adam, with reference also to Irenaeus and Stuart of Alexandria. Second, uh, I will investigate some historical, critical, and patristic interpretations of the new Adam according to Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. And third, I will discuss Aquinas' commentary on these Pauline passages. I hope to offer a portrait of Christ the new Adam that integrates historical, critical exegesis and patristic medieval theology, and most importantly for my purposes, that demonstrates the dogmatic value of contemplating Christ along this typological path. Now, let me explain something here, is that, is that I'm actually not going to do the first two steps. Uh, not even, I, I'm not going to, but those were really the best. Those were the ones on the, on the um, historical, critical, the, the scriptural, and the, and the patristic. And so I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to do, essentially what I'm going to do is essentially like half of the Thomas Aquinas section. And then that'll probably be enough to, um, you know, to get to the time limit. But, um, <laughs> but the, bot the bottom line, y'all, is, is that um, in writing this piece, I, I had trouble because the, the question is, I can see the value. I can see the, as I did all that introduction to basically to tell y'all that I see the value of, of this metaphysically, what I call metaphysically dense. Um, set of questions that arise, um, you know, in the church fathers that really are necessary for interpreting scripture and that Thomas Aquinas presents to us um, early, early there in the Tertia Parts. So I see the value of that. But the question then in my mind is, is there a value, is there a dogmatic value, you know, in thinking, in thinking the redemptive incarnation um, in, in, may, in thinking this along the lines of of new Adam Christology, along the lines of, of um, the new Adam. And so I have to admit to you that, that I w I'm still not totally sure of the answer. But I, so this, is a, this essay is experimental, um, but I, want, I, I, I believe there is a value, and I'm going, to, I'm going to try to make that case. But in my time that remains, though, I'm, a lot of it's going to be spent I'm just simply expositing what St. Thomas actually says about, about the new Adam. So, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see. But that's what, I, that's what I want your help with is, is, um, is figuring out, you know, is there a real dogmatic value in thinking Christ as the new Adam? That's the key question. Okay, so I skip ahead now um, a bunch of pages. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over um, St. Thomas Aquinas on... On, um, on Romans 5. I'm going to skip that, in part because Archbishop de Noya already wrote a wonderful piece in 2009 um, that covers this. And then, of course, and then of course, as soon as I'd written this essay, there was another, another friend um, pointed me to a Spanish essay that is very exhaustively covers it as well. So I thought, gosh, you know. Um, but um, fortunately, I didn't feel that bad about missing the Spanish essay. Um, OK, so let me now turn to Aquinas' discussion of the Adam, new Adam typology in 1 Corinthians 15. Aquinas begins his commentary on 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, by highlighting the dignity that God gives to humanity. God could have redeemed humanity without any human help. God could simply have wiped away sin by fiat. But this would have left Adam as the head of the human race. And it would have meant that Adam's disobedience was never reversed from within the human race. For Aquinas, it is therefore fitting that God send the Redeemer as a new Adam, fully human. In commenting on 
1 Corinthians 15, 22, Aquinas cites two passages from the Gospel of John, namely 5, 26 and 5, 28. These passages show that Christ's causality of eternal life has a twofold dimension. On the one hand, Christ um, can be the cause of our eternal life because he is truly risen in his glorified humanity. But on the other hand, his divinity, his unique relation as son to his father, also bears upon his ability to cause eternal life, including the glorification of his own human nature. In John 5, 26 and 28, Jesus states with, with regard to the coming resurrection of the dead, quote, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. All are to be made alive, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 made alive in Christ, not only because Christ is risen, but also because the Son, begotten of the Father, has, quote, life in himself. Thus, Aquinas unpacks 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22's Adam, New Adam typology in light of the Gospel of John's doctrine of incarnation. And in my, in my historical critical um, section, I showed that that's not normally done in, anymore by um, historical critical exegetes. Commenting on 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49, which is the major section of, of New Adam material, Aquinas again gives the Adam Christ topology a Johannine inflected interpretation. He begins by briefly reflecting upon 1 Corinthians 15, 45's reference to Genesis 2, 7, quote, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. According to Genesis 2, 7, as Aquinas observes, this happened when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's flesh, he specifies that God's breath here is not the Holy Spirit, but for Adam instead to be a living soul simply means being animated. The condition of the first Adam then describes the human possession of earthly life. By contrast, quote, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15:45. But why is Christ called the last Adam? Aquinas pays a lot of attention to, the, to this phrase. According to him, Paul deliberately chooses the term last because Jesus establishes the final destiny of Adam. There can be no further advance, no further progress. In the first Adam, humans are bound to sin and death. In the last Adam, humans receive glory and life. Glorified life is the greatest possible good, since it is a share in the Trinity's own life. To underline this point, Aquinas quotes three biblical texts, and the first is Isaiah 53, 3, which in the RSV reads, quote, He was despised and rejected by men, but which in the Vulgate, as Isaiah 53, 2, describes the suffering servant as, quote, despised and the last of men. This connection between last in the sense of despised, on the one hand, and last in the sense of exalted and unsurpassable, on the other, marks out a nice depiction of the glory and humiliation of Christ's cross, a Johannine theme, for example, John 13. Aquinas also quotes two verses from the book of Revelation here, both of which describe Christ as the last in a manner that makes clear that he is divine, because the same verse verses also describe Christ as the first. And uh, just as we find, of course, in John 1, 1. The two verses are Revelation 1, 17, where the risen and glorified Jesus tells the seer, fear not, I am the first and the last. And Revelation 21, 6, where God proclaims of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The conjunction of these two verses makes Jesus' divinity clear. Thus, Jesus is the last Adam because he is the divine Son incarnate. Christ exceeds Adam, and he restarts the Adamic line. He stands, in a sense, he restarts the Adamic line. He stands not only at the beginning of history as the creator of Adam, but also at the end of history as the one who heals Adam's sin and the sin of all children of Adam, and as the source of the eternal life of the redeemed. In the same context, Aquinas identifies a, another comparison between Adam and Christ. In his original creation, as depicted in Genesis 2, Adam was perfected by the infusion of the soul. This made Adam into what 
Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 46 calls a physical being or, quote, a living soul. By contrast, Jesus is perfected by the work of the Holy, Holy Spirit. It's because of the Holy Spirit that Jesus in his humanity can rightly be described as, quote, a life-giving spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So Jesus shares in Adam's physical nature, but the spirit made Jesus much more. As Aquinas puts it, Jesus is not only living, but also, quote, life-giving. Because as the divine son, he uniquely received the spirit. He has the power to pour out the spirit upon all others. He has this life-giving power. Aquinas appeals here um, to two texts from the Gospel of John, John 1.16 and John 10.10. 10. Um, recall, I, I mean, I mentioned this earlier, in his commentary on Romans 5, Aquinas similarly employs John 10.10, 10, quote, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Aquinas also appeals in the same place to the creed with its confession of faith, quote, in the life-giving Holy Spirit. Even so, does it really make sense for one who is a life-giving spirit to come last? Aquinas, of course, treats this at various points. In the Summa Theology, Aquinas acquire, inquires into this question, why Jesus would come late in the course of human history. In reply, Aquinas again asserts that Paul himself gives the answer. Quote, it is not the spiritual which is the first, but the physical and then the spiritual, 1 Corinthians 15, 46. In the natural world, Aquinas uh, reaffirms, quote, in one and the same thing, the imperfect is prior to the perfect. When Aquinas turns to 1 Corinthians 15, 47, perhaps the crucial text for Adam, new Adam typology, his interpretation accords with that of the fathers, and I, I treat them in that other section. Recall that in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, that Recall that 1 Corinthians 15, 47 states, quote, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Modern commentators generally interpret from heaven here to refer to the risen Christ who will come from heaven. For Aquinas, by contrast, Jesus was made, quote, a life-giving spirit precisely because he came from heaven as a preexistent son. This is why he uniquely bears and bestows a spirit who transforms and exalts the children of Adam. Aquinas thinks that when Paul says that the second man, the new Adam, is from heaven, Paul has in view the incarnation, even if Paul doesn't use that word. Quote, because it is the divine nature that was united to this nature, he is from heaven, end quote. Aquinas comments that given who Jesus is, quote, he ought to have such perfection that it is fitting it come from heaven, namely spiritual perfection. Here again, Aquinas draws a link from Paul to John. In support of Jesus' spiritual perfection, he cites John 3.31, quote, He who comes from above is above all. Larry Hurtado, the biblical scholar, has observed that in numerous, quote, citations of Old Testament passages which originally have to do with God, Paul applies the passages to Jesus, making him the kurios, end quote. Although he notes that a few scholars, and preeminently among them James Dunn, deny that, Christ, that, deny that Paul teaches Christ's preexistence, Hurtado remarks that, quote, the overwhelming majority of scholars in the field agree that there are at least a few passages in Paul's undisputed letters that reflect and presuppose the idea of Jesus' preexistence. And these passages include 1 Corinthians 8.6. Thus, there is no reason to bracket divine preexistence of the kind attested most explicitly by the Gospel of John from the Adam New Adam typology that is found in 1 Corinthians. Certainly, Paul's claim that, quote, the second man is from heaven resonates with the fact that the new Adam is indeed risen and glorified in heaven and will come from heaven. But the phrase from heaven has a polyvalent meaning here. It includes Christ's divine preexistence. As Aquinas says, quote, um, Wait, this isn't a quotation. As Aquinas says, the new Adam, or last Adam, can be a life human spirit to all humanity precisely because he is from heaven, both in his divine preexistence and in his glorified humanity at the right hand of the Father. Aquinas specifies that Paul, in describing Jesus, or the second man, the new Adam, as from heaven, Paul does not mean to say that Jesus 
brought his body from heaven. And so Jesus preexisted eternally as, as a man. That's, that's, of course. This is denied by scripture, which teaches that Jesus is conceived by and born of Mary. Um, for example, Galatians 4.4. 4. As Aquinas puts the matter, Jesus in 1 Corinthians 15.48 is called the man from heaven. Not that he will have borne his body from heaven, since he will have assumed it from the earth, namely from the body of the Blessed Virgin, but because the divinity which was united to the human nature comes from heaven, which was prior to the body of Christ, end quote. For Aquinas, also, the mortality of Adam, though caused by the loss of original justice due to sin, is, in an important sense, natural. It's, this mortality is natural. Uh, for earthly, or it is natural for earthly bodies to age and decay because of the material substrate of which bodies are made. Aquinas thinks this is what Paul means by saying that we, quote, bear the image of the man of dust, 1 Corinthians 15, 49. We are naturally mortal, and, and our bodies do indeed decay and return to the earth through dying and decomposing. Thus, it is Christ who, as the Lord, brings a mortal life to humans because Christ is not held by death, but rises to glorified life. Here Aquinas cites Romans 6, 5, for, which, and quote, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Aquinas further explores 1 Corinthians 15, 49 by reflecting on the life of grace. The fact that, quote, we have borne the image of the man of dust means that we are mortal human sinners. In this way, the likeness of, of Adam is in us, end quote. But in Christ, we now, and, and in eternal life, will also, quote, bear the image of the man of heaven. We do this now through grace, and Aquinas draws a link here to Romans 8.29's teaching about our configuration through grace to the image of Christ. Here, um, here the scholar who um, has written uh, the um, most uh, developed essay on this topic of New Adam, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention him. His name is Louise Cruz. Louise Cruz emphasizes that this means being conformed to Christ's lowliness. This is an interesting point. Uh, what, it, what does it mean to be configured to Christ's grace and to, to bear the image of the man of heaven? Cruz emphasizes this means being conformed to Christ's lowliness. He explains that Christ, quote, wanted to be the novissimus virorum, the last and most despised of men, in order thus to be the novissimus Adam the last and most perfect manifestation of God's love who leads Adam and with him all men and all creation to the height of perfection, end quote. Now, elsewhere in his corpus, Aquinas reflects more briefly on Christ as new Adam. Um, and, and I give a few examples. I give some examples from Philippians commentary, from the Compendium Theologiae, um, and, a fee, and his commentary also on Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Um, and then finally, I give an example from the Secunda Pars of the Summa Theologiae, where he addresses Adam and Eve's um, sin, the sin of pride, um, and contrasts that with humility. Let's see. Um, I, I wanted to skip, skip some of that material. Um, let's see. Okay, so let me think here. And then I, I do a little bit on Augustine in this section, um, but I, I'm gonna, I'll, skip, I'll skip this section. Um, in sum, for Aquinas as for the fathers, the new Adam serves as a way of tying together Christ's saving work in Christ's person, incarnation, and redemption. He's the, um, what we have seen in Aquinas is Pauline commentaries has a place in Aquinas' dogmatic treatment of Christ. In, in Summa Theologia, especially in two places, in the Church of, in the church of Parts. Um, question one, Article 5, on the fittingness of the timing of the Incarnation, in which I mentioned earlier, and question 47, Article 2, on Christ's obedience, reversing Adam's disobedience. As Father Legg remarks, quote, the more we appreciate St. Thomas's close attention to the sacred text and the fundamental role it plays in his thought, the easier it is to dismiss the suspicion that his theology is hostage to foreign philosophical presuppositions or to scholastic abstractions and hypotheticals, end quote. 
Now, now here, here I'm, here let me, um, I'm going to raise some uh, places where I think Aquinas could, could have attended a, um, a, bit, a bit more to the new Adam, and then I'm going to, I'll just, I'll end, I'll end here. I note that Aquinas could profitably have appealed to the new Adam even more than he does in the Summa's Christology. For example, in the Tirshapar's Question 1, Article 1, Aquinas asked whether it was fitting that God should have become incarnate. In responding that the incarnation is the highest possible expression of God's goodness in communicating himself to creatures, Aquinas could have had recourse to the theme of the new Adam, as does Vatican II's Gaudium et Spes when it states, quote, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man becomes truly clear. For Adam, the first man, was a type of him who was to come, Christ the Lord. Christ the new Adam, in the very revelation of the mystery of the Father and of his love, fully reveals man to himself and brings to light his most high, high calling, end quote. Similarly, the set of dogmatic questions arising from the early councils, to which I briefly directed attention at the beginning of this essay, with respect to the union of the divine nature and the human nature in the person of Christ, and uh, that's um, questions two to four of the Teresha Pars. Also, the, with the, the questions on the fullness of the human nature assumed by the Son of God, that's questions five to six of the Teresha Pars. And then also the grace, the questions on the grace of Christ, questions seven to eight of the Teresha Pars, could each have been, been, have been further illuminated by Christ's status as the new Adam? Aquinas emphasizes, as we have seen, that the new Adam or the last Adam is a particularly appropriate title for Christ because he gives grace and eternal life. Christ can do this in his humanity because he is the divine son who receives and sends the spirit. The union of the divine and human natures in the son is what makes Christ the new Adam rather than simply another Adam. If Christ were not fully God and fully man, he could certainly not be the new Adam. And so the fact that he is the new Adam is pertinent, perhaps, to the Christological controversies of the early councils. Likewise, Christ's fullness of grace and his grace of headship are at the very center of his status as the new Adam. Some reference to Christ as the new Adam in these questions of the Summa would arguably highlight the dogmatic importance of confessing Christ as the new Adam. In addition, the value of the new Adam theme for reflection upon the saving power of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection, namely questions 45 to 56 of the Teresha Pars, should be evident from Aquinas' commentary on 1 Corinthians 15 and then also on Romans 5. Okay, now that brings it to an end, but, but I do... Uh, if I, if I had a, um, more time my, in my conclusion, I do direct attention to a, um, a theologian who, coming after Thomas Aquinas, who, who really emphasizes the, in all these ways, all the above ways that I just suggested, emphasizes the New Adam Christology. And that theologian is Julian of Norwich and her vision, her mystical vision of the Lord and the servant. And so that's something also to, to think about. Um, now, what I'm asking from you guys then is to help me, help me reflect further upon um, the significance of New Adam Christology um, for the kind of dogmatics that Thomas Aquinas does and for the kind of Christology that I myself would like to do. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Levering. We have time for some questions. Thank you, Dr. Levering. Dr. Levering, that was fantastic. Um, I just was wondering, and I don't know if this is directly maybe related to the um, question of dogmatic importance, but I was struck by something you said kind of in your introduction where you were pointing to uh, St. Thomas's kind of vision as of um, Christ as the um, the uh, the, sorry, that Adam is the type of Christ, even at his creation at his own creation, that he's a type of Christ, um, seemingly like in his state of original justice as well. So I was wondering if in your, in your estimation or in St. Thomas's estimation, estimation, um, would, uh, it's, it be fitting for Christ to have become incarnate, even if Adam had not sinned and man remained in their state of original justice? To perfect, like you were saying, um, the Imago Dei, I guess. 
Uh, okay, yeah, that, yeah that, I'm, I'm reading a book on that, Justice Hunter, Justice Hunter's book, on, and I forget the title, but it came out from CUA Press. So um, I'm going to do a book review of that. And what, what Justice Hunter shows is, is very interesting, the, um, the different ways that the whole, the whole um, opposition between Aquinas and Scotus um, needs to be um, rethought in certain, in certain ways on, on this, on the, on the topic that you mentioned. So, um, well, you know, Aquinas would, I'm sure it would be, well, on the question of whether it would be fitting for, for Christ to become incarnate, I, I think Aquinas would certainly think that it would be, and would, would, would be fitting, you know, whether, whether scripture, um, whether it would be fitting for us to say that Christ would have become incarnate, that, that's a, that would be a different, a different question, you know. So we, in other words, we we can't necessarily know that know that Christ would have become incarnate, but but I think I think certainly certainly to say that it would be at least as far as I'm concerned to say that it would be fitting, um, you know the incarn the, the the idea that the incarnation is is fitting to God befits God. Well, I think I think that fits with that that is accords with um, Thomas Aquinas's uh, view of the incarnation. You know, he gives the ten reasons why why. Um, why uh, the, the incarnation is, is fitting, and, and those ten reasons um, are, are not limited in any way to solely to our healing from from sin. So, so I think I think certainly yes, it, it's fitting. You know, the incarnation is is fitting. Thank you very much, Doctor Levering. Um, so, it always seemed interesting that the categories of new and old are important in theology mm. which is a kind of distinction it seems from philosophy mm -hmm. where you wouldn't want necessarily to highlight new and old as like ontologically distinctive maybe mm. i mean it seems that it, this comes up in the 20th century like trying to bring timeliness into uh into being um and you brought up how I mean, I guess it's a it's a Latin thing that novissimus, new, most new, also means or can mean last. And uh, and then the thing I wasn't sure if you were trying to draw a distinction about was Paul's last Adam, so the the last Adam being the image in glory, the image of God in glory. Uh, mm -hmm. I think is what something you you said. And then if that's distinct from the new Adam, so maybe that the new Adam is somehow a midpoint between uh, the last Adam and the first Adam, so that, so that there's a nature, grace, glory, first, new, and last. Mm. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of my question is, were you interested in, in uh, distinguishing the new Adam from the last Adam? Or is the is the new Adam the last Adam as the in that Latin sense? Well, well, I'm a, I myself am using I'm using the terms essentially as um, remember I, the new the new Adam is is not not a Pauline term, you know. So the, the new Adam is is a term that is developed developed within the within the um, Catholic tradition. You know, um, the Paul, Paul Paul uses the term uh, last Adam so far as I re remember. Now, of course. First, maybe I don't remember right, and he actually does use the term "new Adam," but I think he does use the term "last Adam." But, but the issue that you're raising that that um, that I am interested in in my paper very much is the relationship between, um, you know, incarnation, the the sense of of Christ, the new Adam, and the and there that being the incarnate one, the the incarnate Lord, um, who uh, essentially. Um, you know, with all that, with all that means, and then, then the sense of new Adam having to do with the redemption, which includes um, the cross and resurrection, and of course the ascension as well. But so, so the risen, the fact that the new Adam is the risen one, and so, so I think for for Thomas Aquinas, these are these are connected; these are tightly bound. Whereas, of course, for contemporary biblical. Uh, New Testament scholars, at least ones I could find, it tends to they tend to emphasize that when Paul talks about the last Adam or the new Adam, he's talking about the risen one, the risen one who is to come, you know, in in the final judgment. 
Um, but this is important for me because um, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in thinking through the incarnation and specifically the redemptive incarnation, you know, with um, a new Adam Christology. And so that's that's where uh, if there is a payoff to the paper, it would be um, in thinking through um, what does new Adam um, bring to a reflection upon um, redemptive incarnation, you know, Christ, Christ the incarnate Lord, uh, the Redeemer. And so, but but yeah, you you made a distinction there for Aquinas. Um, Christ would be the new Adam. You know, both in his incarnation and the new Adam or the last Adam um, as as the risen one. So, in other words, he he would always be the new Adam. You know, um, whether or not he was yet yet had gone through the cross and resurrection. In other words, if you'd even if you met him in Galilee, you know, in the midst of his public ministry, he would be the new Adam. You know, but but he would be he would be such as the incarnate the incarnate one. But remember, the incarnate one is always, for Thomas Aquinas, it's always um, undertaking the redemptive incarnation, the, re the redemption. You know, so. so we have another question. There's at least four more, maybe five plus questions, but Father Langevin is up next. Over here on this side, thank you. Thanks so much for coming, Dr. Levering, and sharing your wisdom with us. A question... Um, since you wanted to speak about the typology of these Old Testament figures, I'm wondering if we also want to expand into what I can, I don't know if it's something someone said before, but an anti-typology. Mm. So, yeah. for instance, you've been using uh, 1 Corinthians 15, where Adam and Christ are pitted as opposites in certain respects. So for instance, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Or Adam as the man of, of dust or the earth, Christ as the, as the one from heaven. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit different than something like uh, when we have like Adam and Eve matched up with Christ in the church kind of a, let's say, a one-to-one -one sort of correlation. Not to say it's one-to-one, -one, but kind of a, a symmetry going on. Do we have a kind of anti-symmetry going on? Does that help us typologically? What's going on with St. Paul here? and What's going on with St. Thomas here? Thank you. Well, that's a wonderful question. I, I love that, anti-typology. Well, I, what I would say is that is that in all these typologies, and and then um, you know, New David or or um, New Moses or or whatever of the other ones that that I that I intend to do, um, you know, there's there's a, uh, quite a, quite a bit of difference. So, so no no, ty no typology, um, you know, between between any of these Old Testament figures and Christ would would exclude. Um, uh, quite quite radical difference, you know, and so for example, the the, the spirit that Adam receives is is just simply just simply he is ensouled, and whereas the spirit that Christ receives, at least the way that Aquinas is understanding, because of the uniqueness of Christ's reception of the spirit, you know, would be the Holy Spirit. So so what I what I think is that in all typologies you have you have um, what you call anti typology because you have radical difference. But but nonetheless, Aquinas would think that in Adam we all die. But but remember, he he think he tends to think that that all all the the whole human race, in in some sense at least at least I'm um, certainly including Christ, um, is mortal is mortal, and so uh, you know is made of mortal flesh. So so there is a there is still the still the the type there the the type the typological relationship in, includes. Um, Includes a note of a note of, um, of similarity, but but within that similarity, yeah, there's going to be also a very very sharp difference, or else Christ would not be the new Adam. So so the whole the whole um, emphasis on on the word new um, is intended to is intended to reflect that that um, 
that radical difference. And then, then the repetition of the word Adam is intended to indicate, um, indicate uh, some, some points of, of correlation or points of analogy, you know, um, you know ty typology there. So, so I think, I think that, um, that that does come out, it comes out fairly well in Aquinas' treatment where he, he really, he says, well, these are the points of connection. This is why we have Adam and the new Adam or Adam and the last Adam. But, but then, but we have to keep in mind that the new Adam or the last Adam is, is radically different in, in, a, in a whole set of ways. You know, so, I mean, does that, does that answer? But I, I love the point of anti-typology. I think that's, that's a good thing to emphasize there. I like that. We'll go next to Brother Charles and then to Father Aquinas. Thank you very much, Dr. Levering. Uh, I wonder if the, the linchpin here might perhaps be that reflecting on the new Adam for a dog, for, for the dogmatic purpose, uh, helps us contemplate the soteriological dynamics of salvation, of the incarnation, okay. namely that um, and I'm thinking particularly here of Article Three in Question One of the Tertiary Pars, where Aquinas asks whether God would have become incarnate had man not sinned, and he says the scriptural evidence says that the overwhelming that the reason that God became flesh is to save us. We we can contemplate what might have happened hypothetically, but the reason is for salvation. And my thought is then that the new Adam as a name for Christ is intelligible only in view of the newness of that is intelligible only in view of the fall. Because even if Adam had not sinned, if God becomes incarnate, there's, I mean, he shares the nature, the Adamic nature, but there's not really anything that needs, I mean, it's elevated, yes, but Adam already has, you know, maximal habitual, or he has, he's, he has habitual grace. He has the, the invisible mission of, of the son in him. And so the newness of the incarnation seems to be less relevant. And, and maybe then with respect to the, um, the typology of the whole, the whole rest of the Old Testament is that each of these fathers, uh, in a way, um, you know, they carry a, a unique office in the Old Testament as God is marshalling us towards salvation, mm -hmm. but they also err in definitive ways. Um, and so, you know, Christ comes and he, 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 in, in being the new Abraham, new Isaac, new David, new, and so forth, mm -hmm. he, um, he heals each of the particular wounds. And so we see maybe the reason for the Old Testament, which is to, uh, to remind us of our need for salvation. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So you're, you're saying the, um, the, the typology, the, the dogmatic synonyms of the typology really is, is in the redemptive side, of not, not the incarnation side, as it were, if, if, you, could, if you can even separate them. But um, and now, now Aquinas, he emphasizes that, that Christ is, that, that when he talks about the new Adam, he, he talks about, well, um, it really emphasizes that Christ is, is God. Christ is, so therefore he is, he's not just Adam, but he's new Adam because he's God. And, and then he, he does the same when he talks about the fact that Christ can bestow grace and that Christ can bestow resurrection and, and, or that Christ can bestow glory, bestow eternal life. Um, he, he, Christ's grace then also, you know, and, and, and Christ's grace, of course, I can see how that's connected with, well, of course, everything about Christ is connected with, with um, our salvation in a way, but, but I, I wonder, I wonder, it does seem to me that, um, that Aquinas makes it fairly clear that it's a union of the, of the two natures that makes him the new Adam. And I'm, I'm not sure that that, that is, um, I know it's, it's for the purpose of our redemption, I, I know that, but but would that not be on? Would that not just um, simply be the? He's the incarnate one. So I'm, I'm wanting to. I'm definitely wanting to, to be able to meditate, um, to use the new Adam Christology, um, not not only for um, the reflection on Christ's saving work, but also I'm suggesting that we can use the new Adam Christology for reflection on Christ's person. And on the on the questions that that Aquinas treats early in the Summa, for example, the first eight questions. I mean, so those are, you know, that's I, I'm essentially I'm essentially saying that I love the first eight questions that Aquinas does, and I wish that he had done more of New Adam Christology in the first eight questions. That's essentially my 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 point. But I'm I'm feeling very sheepish saying that because if Aquinas didn't do it, you know, then he must have had a good reason, you know. And who am I? To, yeah.
Thank you, Dr. Levering, for that wonderful paper. I look forward to reading the whole thing uh, when it's published. My question is this. I think the popular understanding of calling Christ the new Adam or, or understanding Christ as bearing the title of the new Adam would, would focus somewhat or it carries the meaning of uh, headship or paternity yeah. that yeah. he and Adam. So the, the connection there with Adam is that both Adam and Christ stand at the head, the beginning of not only eras of human history, but also mm-hmm. kinds of creation. Uh, yeah. And so that being the, I think maybe the predominant or popular understanding, you've given us reason to think tonight, I mean, by alluding, well, pointing to scripture, but also looking at texts in, in Aquinas that emphasize uh, sonship as, as being, um, you know, a principle part of the content of, the, of that type or that, that, uh, that title. I'd like to hear more, just your thought about perhaps the, the relation of those two, both paternity and sonship, uh, you know, in, in being uh, well, Adam uh, and the new Adam, uh, and uh, whether you think those two things might be intention or how they resolve and perhaps one becoming maybe surprisingly more predominant than, than the other. Now, what a, what a great question, Father, because in, my, in the introduction of my paper, I, I asked the question of what, is it, what does it mean for Christ to have a filial mode? And then I say that, um, I say that uh, reflecting upon the new Adam, reflecting upon Christ in terms of the new Adam will help us understand um, how Christ, what it really means to have a filial mode. I say that in the introduction, but you have to remember that I wrote that sentence kind of late in the game. And and I never really filled it out. I never, I'm not sure that I really persuaded myself. I thought that was, I thought I wrote the sentence because it sounded like a really good idea. But then did I did I really have I have I figured out a way to draw those connections? And and I feel like I haven't. Now now in when Aquinas talks about the Roman text, the text from Romans five, that's where he does all the headship material. So it may be that by only reading the first Corinthians thing because of because of time. Uh, it may be that that's kind of the problem and that if I'd read the Romans 5 material where I do talk about headship and, and, and things like that, um, that I would have had a lot, like uh, there's a lot of more material there perhaps to connect with, with sonship. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, think, I think that, um, you know, I tried to answer the type of question you're giving by um, some reference to the work of um, uh, Cruz. I forget his first name now. Um, what Cruz says is that is that the um, filiation or to be the divine son. He 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 says, well, what that what that means is is this you know is this sort of essentially radical self emptying. You know, it's um, or it's a self, essentially self surrendering or or being despised, being the being the last. You know, kenosis, and so I think there's room there to to think about that and to um, to reflect upon the relationship between um, sonship and kenosis. Um, and it doesn't have to be put into Balzarian language; it could just simply be put in terms of um, obedience, or um, if obedience is even even that is a bit uh, uh, Balzarian, I suppose. So that could you could put it just in terms of love, you know, or in terms of um, you know those type of uh, you could you could find a way to think in terms of of what it means to be son in in, in that in that way. Um, so I got to write that down though because I got to come back to that and Aquinas himself doesn't spell it out when when he's commenting on um, on Romans five and and Romans uh, and one Corinthians fifteen he doesn't spell out the whole issue of of, of sonship although uh, although I do think the material is there. Um, when when he's thinking about the new Adam and the and the new Adam's obedience and the re- the reversal of the pride by by the perfect humility, I do think he's he is thinking about about the divine Son of the Father in that in that perfect um, coming forth and that perfect um, you know kenosis or whatever you want to call it. So I, I think there's ways from within Aquinas' theology to to draw that out, but but he he himself doesn't really do that. 
you know, in his in his biblical commentaries. Maybe because the maybe because Raymond or whoever was writing it down forgot to write down that part. You know that he he was about to write down, but then he a fly buzzed by and he he missed what Aquinas was talking about that way. Uh, Dr. Living, being uh, if I may take the privilege of being the one who's actually holding the microphone to inter interject a question out of order here. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for a marvelous paper and tremendous uh, uh, rich reflections. Um, I, when you talk about the, the filial mode, of course, my ears immediately perk up because that's something I'm really interested in. And um, if I had to just off the top of my head, talk about that, about how like the human race now can be configured to the filial mode of Christ, that it means that we're oriented back towards the father, that we're on a trajectory of return to the father, something like that. Okay. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe you could say something about what it means to do a kind of new Adam uh, Christology in the contemporary theological context, maybe jumping off from, say, the Gaudium et Spes passage that you mentioned, where there might be a temptation to think that if we're talking about the new Adam, we're talking about us. So we're back to kind of not so much being focused on God, but being focused on uh, the human race and what, like maybe what God can do for us or, or what he is doing for us, something like that. But, um, you know, having it be much more a um, creation focused or creature focused or anthropo anthropocentric way of thinking about the question. Uh, and certainly there are some people writing in contemporary Christology that succumb to a kind of, um, I mean, they, they want to speak about Jesus principally as a man and begin from there. Um, and, and will make judgments about their interpretation of passages of scripture, for example, using that kind of criterion versus a, a, an approach to the new Adam, which really is directed back to the father or is something, you know, kind of accenting, accentuating that the human race becomes intelligible as from God and returning to God. Yeah. That's my question. Uh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that, that's one, one reason why the, um, the newness of the new Adam, you know, really does have to be grounded in the, in, in the incarnation, you know, um, because, because the, then, then you have a strong sense of sonship and, and, then also, and then also you have a strong sense of what, what does it mean to, to be um, caught, up, caught up into the new Adam? What well, it does mean to, to uh, be united to him as, as he returns to the Father and through, through the Paschal mystery and so on. I, I don't know. In the in the conclusion of the in conclusion paper, I have a really fun quote from um, Yuval, um, Yuval Yuval Harari. And if if you haven't read Yuval Harari, he's the guy who writes um, writes books like Homo Deus, and bestseller things that you find in, you can find in the um, in the you know in the um, airport airport bookstore that type of thing. You know, but he's this he's a fascinating thinker because he he's one of those who writes the history of everything. He's kind of the history of everything type. And then it, it all ends up with Homo Deus, how and he has a, he has another book called Homo Sapiens, I think, or no, just maybe it's just Sapiens. And anyway, these are these are two very significant books because what he does is he popularizes um Ludwig Feuerbach. And essentially the basic idea is just that just that what Christianity is a significant um, religion, he thinks. Um, because Christianity puts man at the center, and then all you have to do is get rid of God, and, and you're kind of making progress, you know, and so, and so on. And so, to, to me, what I argue in my conclusion actually is that the new um, new Adam Christology is very valuable in responding to that type of stuff because because the the greatness of the new Adam, why he's not just another Adam. If he were another Adam, then he'd be Sapiens, or he'd be you know even just Homo Deus instead of instead of the God man, you know, the, um, the new Adam is, and that's why I consider the incarnation to be um, so, so fundamental. And, and then also an answer, an answer to, um, you know, to that uh, kind of distorted um, anthropocentrism. You know, um, every time you have to think about a new Adam or a last Adam, you really get, you are reminded that just Adam is, is not enough. Adam is radically not enough, you know? So I, I don't know if I'm, Am I am I on the right track here, or am I am I falling uh, off the cliff? Uh, absolutely, <laughs> on the right track. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Um, my question is about, um, uh, well, so you spoke about um, Christ being the, the last or the, the new Adam. Now, does that carry some notion of exemplarity, Christ being the exemplar of Adam? I'm, I'm thinking in particular, so most yeah, of your yeah, quotations yeah. were from the New Testament, um, but where uh, a text from, well, je first, uh, first chapter of Genesis where uh, the Lord says, let, let us make Adam in our image that, I mean, that could be the father speaking to the son or the, the whole Trinity speaking to itself. But, um, and, that, and, and if it is the father speaking to the son saying, let us make man in, in your image and the image of the son, um, that is making, let us make Adam in the image of the word. That's the word as pre-incarnate. So I'm wondering if, uh, if Adam is made in the image of the pre-incarnate word, does that make then the new Adam, Christ is the new Adam, Primarily, is Adam is Adam the type of Christ primarily in his divine nature as word, since he was made in the image of the word in the beginning, or according to more to his human nature? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, is Adam well, you know, and Thomas Aquinas would think think in terms of um, you know, Adam being made to know and love God. You know, so that's that's the Imago. And so and so, um, you know, Jesus and the the word, the word is is the expression of of the Father, um, who then, um, you know, uh, you know, who love who loves who, uh, you know, sends the Spirit within the within the divine um, Trinity within the um, Trinitarian relations. I, I don't know. In terms of your question, though, I do admit to you that that Aquinas doesn't. He doesn't treat this with sort of the, the um, ex extensiveness or perhaps even the depth that you would you would in someone like um, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon or something like that. So when I when I do my little section on Irenaeus, um, there's there's more of that there's more of that sense of um, the the way in which um, the ad Adam is is um, you know. Uh, Adam doesn't have priority. The new Adam has priority, and then Adam is Adam is made on the basis of the exemplar who is the new Adam. The new Adam is first. Now Aquinas says that though, you know, he 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 does say the you know that that the new Adam is first. The new Adam is is not is not second. You know, um, there is a, a priority um, of the of the new Adam, and so and that is because that is because the new Adam is is the Son. You know, is the Word. And and so that's and so and so Adam then was was made to to know and love made to you know to be to be an image of and therefore to be like the image with a capital I you know which is the word Adam was made to be an image like that but of course Adam Adam um, got the got the good plan to have pride and all that stuff and and things went south you know. So Aquinas talks like that, but he doesn't. It, it is true that he doesn't. He doesn't um, develop it as much, perhaps. But he, he, it's there. You know that that that, that point. I think we have time for just one final brief question. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Doctor Lering, for your presentation. It was very good, and I wanted to follow up on just exactly the last two questions. Uh, like sometimes. Many Christologies are made like from up, from below, like Father Dominic said, like an image of man, like from below. And we, we see the, the great confusion there is today about what we are and what we're supposed to be. So my question is, what is the influence of uh, Aquinas' Christology on his anthropology? Uh, and how studying Christ as a new Adam could have very good consequences also for today's philosophical anthropology uh, for us today. Mm. Well, that's that's a wonderful question, and I don't really, um, gosh, I don't I don't know the answer. Um, I I just I fo I focus so much on the Tershapars, you know. So what? Yeah, for his anthropology, you know. But I I'm sure though that well, it is it is different. You know, in Irenaeus there is there is the sense that um, that not only the soul, which is which is the lowercase image of of the of the of the image with a uppercase. So Aquinas has that, you know, has the sense of that you have the rational creature being, um, you know, made to the image of of 
of the word. No, so so there there you can have the the new the new Adam and the and the Adam um, connected and and you can see an anthropological um, connection. But but um, Irenaeus goes so far as to say that um, at the very body of Adam is copied from the um, eternal exemplar. So uh, so the human body the human body also this is like a theology of the body um, taken to the next level. But uh, but I do think I do think Aquinas also thinks about the body as made completely for the soul, and so the body as expressing made to express the soul, kind of like God's art, you know, as enabling the um, like our body is in. Is, remember how Aquinas talks about that? He talks about our the fact that we have hands and a, a face and eyes that point outward, and and all the other things that he talks about. So it's possible. I think it's possible that that it could be. Um, you know that you can make the connections in Aquinas for for that, although although I'm still I'm still wanting. Remember, I I'm just I'm just doing my book to my book is supposed to um, be on Christology, and so I have to figure out how how the new Adam can can. And you guys are giving me a lot of great leads. I'm very grateful to you, all the people who ask questions. Um, I, I wish I wish I had uh, I had these good questions before um, uh, giving this talk. But now I'm going to go back in, and I really will. Feel, I really will um, work on this for sure. So I'm very grateful to all of you who gave me these uh, insights. Very much appreciate it. Let's give our final appreciation for Dr. Levering. Thank you.